today's talk is what it really takes to achieve a digital transformation. So it's really important to understand what constitutes a transformation. Um, a transformation is a thorough and dramatic change. A true transformation means everyone must change, not just some or most, but all. And without all, failure is probable. I can't tell you how many times in my career where an organization has tried to roll out a transformation um, and management wasn't involved or wasn't going to participate or certain groups, certain entities. And I can tell you every single time they never tr achieved that full transformation. And when it comes to a digital transformation, um, this is really uh, critical as it provides new ways of working, high efficiency gains, um, reduces waste, etc. So how do you get change to happen and stick? So you can get it to happen, but it doesn't always stick. So that adoption, um, and again, we've all experienced this in our careers most likely. Uh, if you haven't um, and you don't th do things well, you probably will experience it at some point. You first must have a culture of acceptance and understanding. Um, that means that um, you can't uh, partake or move forward uh, in some strategies without the right uh, behaviors and the right acceptance, etc. You must have stakeholder and management alignment. Again, if you're misaligned, um, you could get a quarter of the way through something and it falls apart because again, that, that, that alignment and the stakeholders aren't there, uh, protecting or covering for the program project or the journey that you're going on. You must provide change management at the right speed. Again, uh, change is very difficult, especially for people mired in their work. Um, the, the, the way they do it, the, the, how they learned how to do it. And, and some of those experiences could be 5, 10, 15 years in the making. Um, and getting people to stop what they're doing and do something differently is a very daunting task. And you have to be very careful and intentful when you do it. Uh, you have to have representative change agents. You have to have people who are doing this as part of their role, either all of their role or part of their role in an organization, um, whether it's internal or it's a, a contractual uh, service-oriented basis, it's, it's critical. You must convert your biggest opponents so they become your biggest champions. Again, uh, if you don't do this, you'll you'll constantly be uh, working against some of those people. And unfortunately, depending on their personalities, they may even try to undermine what you're doing. So you have to uh, convert those, those folks to become your champions. Uh, and then there needs to be a balance of what's in it for me as the end user, as the scientist, as the researcher, as, as somebody that's going to be using uh, particular software, new ways of working, and what's in it for the organization. So um, these are critical things to take into account, knowing where and when compromises can be made um, uh, and approaches can be altered. I will tell you, though, that what comes with change are a lot of excuses from a lot of different people. And so you have to really understand what those excuses are and are they are they valid are they wants are they needs etc um be prepared to do some soul searching so i can't tell you how many organizations i've worked in over the years but in my 30 years of doing this uh but it's it's uh probably close to somewhere between 50 and 100. Um, and many organizations have evolved and changed over the years and may not have 
only an identity crisis, but severe disconnect between management and staff. So if you're in a large R&D organization, um, be prepared for this. Um, it's inherent. Um, with with size comes complexity, and with complexity becomes um, silos and uh, different ways of working, uh, communication breakdowns, um, unbalanced approaches to solving problems. So IT and the business, and I didn't use the word versus there, but you you know you you could have an organization where IT and the business. Uh, work together in unison or equal partners. Um, you'll get some where that is not the case. Uh, so you don't know what you're stepping into. And you almost have to assume the worst um, because that's part of your due diligence, your assessments, your ability to understand um, the level of dif dysfunction that you're, you're walking into. Because if you don't understand that, it's going to really set you back. Um, and many times organizations will tell you that everything's working great. There's no issues. Oh, it's wonderful. Um, and you find out three to six months into a major journey type project that that's not the case and that there's a big lump under the, the carpeting in the middle of the room. And that's where it's all at. Uh, why isn't there compliance with the use of many R and D? And I have a little D there on purpose based software tools um in research it can be a, a, a much different culture uh must much less managed much less compliant in the development side of the house there are more rules in place because sometimes they're forced rules from a regulatory validation perspective um, and i'm not saying that the, the areas are perfect but they tend to have less issues than the R side of the house when it comes to compliance and the use of the tools, uh, et cetera. Um, why don't you treat your data and processes like an asset, like currency? Um, this again, this is what you're gonna run into and, and why we have uh, some of the data and data infrastructure issues that we have um, because it's not necessarily um, thought of as a asset. Uh, companies and organizations aren't managing their, uh, their scientific data and processes like a bank is managing your money. And I've, I've given so many talks on this, but um, you know, the, the concept of fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable is um, a, a very important set of uh, principles to try to achieve, um, and it, it's part of the overall uh, strive of, of data excellence, uh, data integrity, et cetera. And then why do we have all this technical debt? So this is a very uh, important issue today, and it, it's been around for, for many years in a biopharmaceutical company. Fortunately, you know, we work with companies on uh, in life sciences, we work with companies in material sciences, agri-science, et cetera. Um, and the biopharmaceutical industry is sometimes viewed as the, the, you know, the rich cousin or the, uh, the, the, the rich uh, side of the house. Um, they have one of everything. Deprecation in um, biopharmaceutical companies is difficult. Um, there are sometimes one of everything. Um, there are things that just haven't been turned off and deprecated or, or gotten rid of. Um, all of this is part of a scientific data process and decision strategy that every R&D organization not only should have, but must have um, in order to manage technical debt um, and ways of working, et cetera. So uh, sometimes there's identity crises in, in these organizations and you do have to seriously navigate uh, your way around to figure out, um, you know, what the elephant in the room is. 
Um, be prepared for a total transformation, not just a digital transformation. This is one of our biggest lessons learned um, when you are stepping into a transformation. Of course, there's going to be a lot of processes that come along for the ride. So uh, older ways of working are all around us. Some examples of those are, hey, things are being done in paper, very manual processes. People are still using fax machines to uh, set, set, send even data or information around paper catalogs, uh, non-networked instruments, shared drives, uh, you name it. We still see it today. Not as much as we used to, but it's still out there. Um, but what happens is your processes are going to change because you're going from one way of working to another. Um, so you're using different software now. Uh, you're you're uh, using more controlled vocabularies. You're doing things in a, a much different manner. Um, integrations are going to get go, going to be needed. How you do your science can probably and will ch probably will change. Example given: automation, high throughput experimentation, etc. These are givens, um, and once you start to iterate through through this you realize once the the end users the scientists realize where they got an efficiency gain or a new way of working and it's it's very helpful to them uh reduces their burden uh they're going to realize oh well now that i can do that i want to go do this so this is part of the journey um and that's really how you have to frame it out but the the misnomer uh in the uh industry today is oh we're going to do a digital transformation we're going to we have multiple steps we're going to digitize we're going to do this we're going to have an electronic laboratory environment this and that there's a tremendous amount of ways of working change that's going to happen and even sometimes uh, that will force not only the processes to change it's a great opportunity by the way for process harmonization and then optimization um, and we'll get to that in a little bit, but the, uh, the science could change. It could be decided that we're going to now automate these, these particular processes. Uh, we're actually going to invest in high throughput experimentation, um, because we just realized that, um, the amount of uplift we could get by doing, uh, this type of work in a high throughput way, uh, could really be benefit the organization as well as the, uh, the scientists. So I talked about that uh, process harmonization and optimization. Um, this is uh, really uh, a, a critical thing for everybody to do. Um, if you haven't business process mapped your laboratories, uh, you're, you're making a huge uh, uh, a mistake. And the reason is that the, the, once this is a fundamental truth for a laboratory environment, you not only reduce the amount of disconnect between the bench level scientists, management, um, and those around them, um, but now you can uh, ensure proper requirements gathering. You'll allow for methodical change. You're going to provide oversight. You're going to provide training to new joiners and, and, and people that need to become familiar with the laboratory um, that, that weren't before, et cetera. And these become living documents. Um, this is uh, extremely important when it comes to complex software deployments. Um, I can tell you in my career, we have seen 40% of requirements gathered never delivered and there's a multiple reasons for that but one of the big reasons is there was not a there was no clarity when it came down to what was actually happening in that laboratory uh, either process or set of processes and the only way to get that clarity is um, through business process mapping uh, the other thing that happens it's a, it's also an insurance policy um, when you go to hire uh, maybe somebody to help you deploy a new scientific software tool, et cetera, um, it, it's a guarantee on both sides 
that the project is uh, there's clarity. It's well understood what's going on. The requirements can be matched and there's no surprises. There's no 11th hour surprises. Oh, we deployed a pilot or we did this or that and it was way off from what was expected. Um, so it just drives that that clarity um, and ultimately the success of a project program or journey. All right. So what are the layers of digital transformation? So we have uh, delivered on successful uh, journeys uh, with our clients. First one is start with the culture change. You have to ensure that you have the right culture um, to bear and deploy uh, a digital transformation. You must have a data process decision strategy. If you don't, it's just like any other aspect of your personal life. If you don't write down your objectives and your goals, chances are you're not going to achieve them. You're going to forget what they were. You're going to lose focus. Um, you don't have that to go back and reference. And that's a, this is really what this strategy becomes. It becomes a written strategy that uh, ensures uh, the right data environments are set up, the right software is selected, the right instrumentation is selected. At the end of the day, this all has to come together in a very efficient manner for an R&D organization to um, really thrive uh, and run on all cylinders. Um, scientific software solution must be properly configured on day one. Uh, but need to have fully managed data environment or else. So what, what, what am I saying here? I can't tell you how many uh, ELN deployments, uh, deployments that we've been called in on where it was a paper on glass environment, which means no configuration, a very generic template, and lack of training. People are just putting in very unstructured results, approaches. It's burdensome for the end users. And it's not doing it's not bringing any value to the organization. Um, and so, again, if you don't have your 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 at a minimum data dictionaries, then your taxonomies or ontology in your say, I'm using ELN as an example, um, you are going to have major problems three, six, 12 months into your journey with your ELN. Um, your compliance will be low. And again, I'm speaking all from experience of, of what we run into on a daily, weekly basis. Third, uh, the mentality of this a project, you will fail in your, again, I'll, I'll pick it on ELN deployment. It's not a project, it's a journey. The first part of it is selecting the right tool for your organization. The second part of it is stepping through the process of a deployment. And a lot of times people high five, high five themselves after that and say, oh, we did it. We did a great job. Great job, everyone. But that is only the beginning of your journey. The amount of work that happens after that from a template configuration, um, from uh, bringing on new technology, new science integration, bringing a very stable, usable environment to the end users that decreases their burden, not increases their burden. It makes things less manual for them, more automated. Uh, this is where every scientist and researcher wants to be. I, I I'll take this moment here to tell you that many scientists in the lab are overworked. They're, they're stressed out. They've got tight timelines. Things need to work. They're under a lot of pressure and stress. The last thing you want to ask them to do is spend more hours in their week putting things manually into their ELN. Um, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. So again, think of the end users, their quality of work life. Um, keep that in mind when uh, you're going through this process. Two strategic goals of an R&D digital transformation are fair data and processes, reproducible science. Um, this is really the top level things that 
uh, you should be getting from your digital transformation. The efficiency gains realized are millions to billions. And there have been um, reports and studies done. Uh, the European Union uh, did a report several years ago and basically $28 billion uh, a year is what it's costing uh, R&D organizations in the European Union that don't have fair data and processes. Um, so again, uh, you could miss that blockbuster drug. There are plenty of examples of where unknown uh, new molecular or molecular entities are sitting on a shelf um, and they've got to market late. And today there's some of the most powerful cancer drugs in the world. So imagine the two years of people that didn't get that drug that unfortunately probably aren't with us here today. Um, it has real consequence. Th th this, is, uh, this is a very like serious thing. Imagine during the COVID pandemic, if we all had our act together, the amount of misinformation that didn't come out, the amount of data sharing that could have happened, we could have probably gotten through some of these things 50% faster um, if we had fair data and process environments. So what problems can go away with a true R&D digital transformation? Um, data wrangling. Right now, I have seen areas in, in biopharma companies that have 80% data wrangling. That's 80% of a, a researcher's time spent trying to find data, access data, make it work with other data, and you know ultimately have data that's reusable, whether it's uh, machine learning, deep learning, generative AI, et cetera. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's getting better though. The pandemic did open some people's eyes and uh, did make people aware of, of the painfulness um, during that uh, unfortunate time lost or trash slash dark data right again um, start to diminish this waste that's going on today in our organizations intellectual property loss poor collaboration collaboration is key to what we do today if co many companies have mandated 80 percent externalization of their r d capabilities uh, when you get only summary reports back from a collaborator. Uh, you don't can't get to see the, the level of detail. Uh, it takes days or weeks to get that back when there's an issue or a misunderstanding or a concern. The, all these things add up. This is what adds up to the cost of uh, getting a, a new drug or therapy to market. Uh, need for more resources. You, you could do more with less if we could get our digital transformations done in a, a more timely manner. Longer cycle times, faster to market, uh, faster through discovery, faster through development. Uh, repeating of experiments. We work with clients where it's as high as 50% of experiments are repeated because they can't find the, the initial original data or uh, things were documented so poorly they couldn't repeat the experiment. This starts in academia, by the way. This isn't just a, a, an industry issue. Uh, unfair data environments, again, uh, can't find it or have problems finding it, have problems accessing it, uh, bringing the data together because a lot of the metadata is missing and ultimately reusable. Um, it, there, it's problematic. Poor morale. Uh, goes away because people are now um, not wasting their time looking for things, but actually spending their time doing more science, having more and better conversations about the science, um, and not dragged down by a lot of the mundane tasks that they have to do today. And then that poor quality of work life. Uh, the stress can be reduced when things work in a much more efficient manner. Um, people are able to get their work done um, and, and feel good about it. So let's just talk about the ELN a little bit because this is for uh, Revity uh, signals. So uh, today, uh, ELN and R&D organizations, there are some better and best practices. So pro you're going to need that proper culture change, proper change management, 
all the things that I said before is critical. I'll just touch on the the the, the paper on glass. You have to have your data and, and adoption of data standards in your notebook on day one when you deploy it. Um, but getting out of this paper on glass uh, temporary first step when you deploy your uh, your ELN uh, is critical. This cannot last for more than three months. You need to get out of paper on glass in three months. And every group that's using that ELN should start to get their uh, workhorse templates uh, that they will use consistently and, and then can evolve uh, newer templates from there. You have to understand your return on investment. If you stay in a paper and glass environment, you're going to have a negative return on investment with an ELN. It's, it's unfortunate, but the, the, from the cost and, and everything else. And understand your total cost of ownership. And I'm just going to take a second to, to tell you what I'm saying here. Many times uh, a, a partner vendor will come in and say, hey, this is this uh, we, we assessed, uh, we looked at your analysis uh, and it's going to cost this much for to to properly deploy and get your ELN adopted. And they're like, oh, that's a lot of money. We can't afford that. See you later. Somebody, another partner vendor comes in and says, oh, yeah, we can do it for a lot less than that. We can do it for this. Be very suspect about that. Do your due diligence. Do the proper assessments. Uh, a lot of times, uh, total costs of ownership are met with a very adverse reactions, um, and companies go with the less costing one. But through our analysis, we have shown that the ones that go after the cheaper, less expensive options, many times there's many things missing and your adoption fails and ultimately your ELN deployment fails. And um, it, it's just, it's not a good situation. So the purpose of an ELN is simple it, it, and it's lost. Like I'm baffled by why, uh, what, what people think today about an ELN. It's to capture the scientific method it's to make sure that you have a scientifically aware, aware, fair data and process environment. You have reproducible science. This, these, are, these are critical, critical things for an R&D organization. You're capturing your organization's intellectual property and you're driving massive efficiency gains. This is the purpose of an ELN today. It's not a place to do arts and crafts. It's not a place to increase the scientists and researchers' time, uh, mundane tasks and things like that. It's a, supposed to be a very uh, usable environment that is the center of what many scientists do and allows them to ultimately use the tool to generate ideas, figure out what others have done and not repeat it, um, it be highly searchable, uh, and be a wealth of knowledge, uh, not only for their, the end users, the researchers, and the scientists, but for management and the organization as a whole. So some ELN facts. Many organizations deploy an ELN and fail to evolve past paper on glass. I, I should have like a failure sticker here. That's failure. You don't want to be in that situation. It's going to cost you a lot of money and, and, and a lot of, you're going to lose faith to uh, from an IT informatics perspective, at some point the end users will start to lose faith in IT, and that's very very expensive to get back. We've encountered organizations that have only 40 to 60 percent use compliance of their research ELN. My first question is, where's the data going? I can tell you that I've seen people go to the local pharmacy, apothecary, and buy paper notebooks. I've seen it written on scrap papers. I see people keep it in Word. I see people say, oh, we're going to go write or make our own ELN and OneNote. Um, all these things that are counterproductive to the organization um, goals that I described before. The level of reproducible science from poorly managed ELN environments has been as low as 50%. I, man I mentioned that before, but I'm repeating things here on purpose. And then... Uh, uh, this statistic came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, there's an industry metric that claims some organizations are only capturing 12% of their required ELN data. Again, this is something that the, the industry has to do much better. 
uh, with, and you will hear more excuses than you've ever heard of why we don't want to or we're not going to use or we don't feel we should have to use an ELN. And so it, it, it behooves everybody on both sides to do a better job. We must do a better job. And I think what you're going to see uh, in this conference is a company that has done a better job and uh, is building, has built a really nice uh, ELN. So I want to thank you for your attention. I hope that I'm helping somebody out there. Uh, don't struggle. Let us know how we can help you. We help people from all types of uh, organizations, and we also uh, spend anywhere from an hour to two years working with some of our clients to write to ship. So don't hesitate in contacting us. Uh, thank you very much.